thank you very much for inviting me to the conference here. I um, just arrived in from Edinburgh, so I apologise for my Scottish accent if you, if you can't understand me. Um, the Politics of High Rise, fantastic title, thank you very much. Um, I'm sure everybody knows that there are politics with every high rise project, but uh, this particular project gets more than its fair share. Uh, just a little bit about RMGM. Uh, we're an international uh, company uh, with studios, 15 studios around the world. And what we're all about is contextual response, about place making and about resp responding to place and understanding place. Uh, so there's an irony in some ways in how uh, certain people within St. Petersburg have responded to our proposals. And hopefully once I've taken you through the presentation, you'll understand why. I see a little bit of Russian text creeping in here. Thanks, Arthur. I, th I think uh, it's actually moving from Mac to uh, PC. But um, you, you see here, it was a project that we won through competition uh, with some well-known names, with uh, the Lieberskind, Jean Nouvel, Herzog and de Muren, uh, and the like. Uh, it's for a, a brownfield development, 74 hectare master plan was part of it, and for a, a 300 meter high tower. But of course, we have to decide for ourselves whether or not a tower was the right thing to do. And 280,000 square meters of accommodation, of which about 35% is for public use, and the rest for commercial office use. This is our, um, our, 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 our award. Um, Say award winning, that would be nice. Uh, our competition winning um, design, um, really very much about the Baroque of the city, about the richness and, and the, 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 the quality of the, of the city in terms of its development through, um, from the, the Russian Romantic period through Baroque um, and, and forwards, really taking it forwards into the new millennium. It's a building full of movement. Um, Static in some ways, very powerful and simple, but then the movement is overlaid uh, through the skin. So I thought the politics of high rise was an interesting starting point for an explanation of, of what these issues are all about within the city. And I thought this was a good uh, expression, perhaps, of what people think, perhaps wrongly, about what we're doing. If you take the P as the center of the city, um, St. Petersburg, uh, as, as this kind of conservative heartland. Because of an America, I, I, I knew conservative is red, so I've got the alternative. But basically, you take the, the grain of the text of the politics of high rise, and you imagine that to be the city grain, and you've got one of the most horizontal city grains in Europe. You have a city with 4.6 million people in, a huge city, where an awful lot of that city grain of, is, is of historical uh, significance. And you have our project, some five kilometers, six kilometers um, from the, the city center. And I think people perceive it as this, this object which will completely dominate the, the, the skyline. And um, w because we're contextual, because we really feel understanding the place is the starting point of every project, um, we just knew that wasn't correct. So I'll take you through the... Sorry. I'll take you through the, um, the, the site and, and, and some of the, the points about the city. Uh, you see our, our tower kind of ghosted out there, sitting on the site. Um, and in the red there, the red line in the background is actually the conservation area, the UNESCO-listed uh, area of the city. And the site in which our project is, is located is entirely industrial. And you can actually travel from the airport to this site without passing one historical building. So first of all, we're, we're thinking, well, you know, this is really a, a brownfield regeneration site. It's an area which needs investment. And potentially, um, this could act as the spark for that. A tower, well, a tower could um, act as the focus point for regeneration. And, and really, um, the river, the Okta, and the Neva coming together makes it a very special site and, and the right place for something of significance. And this is an interesting slide which compares Venice on the right with St. Petersburg on the left to scale. And you can see Venice, you know, this beautiful UNESCO-listed green that could actually almost have a, a glass dome put over the top of it to protect it. It's, it's, it's that small and, and that, that kind of um, minute in some ways compared to St. Petersburg. St. Petersburg, on the other hand, um, is, is a huge area, a huge area of uh, historical fabric and then some later additions by the communists and, and, and other parts. 
And I know St. Petersburg so well, I've been going there for more than 14 years. And I, I went there actually with UNESCO um, to look at the Hermitage Museum, which is the little red dot there. And that little red dot is the center of the city, and the little blue dot is, is our site for Gazprom. And really, it raises a question, you know, what do you do in a historical fabric which is going to need huge investment just to, to, to protect it and, and um, have it uh, conserved continuously year on year? And what do you do to try and bring new investment in without spoiling it? And also, if you bring a tower object or any kind of landmark structure in there, if it was um, so far away from the centre of the city as to not be seen at all, would it have any relevance? It might as well be in Moscow or in another city. So there's this balance between bringing the tower close enough to the city centre to act as part of the whole composition and having it so far away that it, it doesn't work anymore. But you see here in the picture the centre of the city. This is the palace square with the Hermitage and Peter and Paul Cathedral and the uh, Admiralty Building, which is the center point for setting out of the whole of the grain of the city. This is the Admiralty. A beautiful spire, uh, a beautiful building um, of its period. And the Hermitage uh, by Rastrelli, uh, the famous uh, Baroque architect, who really took the kind of classical form and overlaid with layers of richness on top. And here's the, the Church of the Spilt Blood, which is a, the, the, the Russian Romantic style, which has the, the swirling domes, which are akin to uh, St. Basil's in Moscow. And of course, St. Petersburg is the place of the revolution. This is where it all started in, in 1917, you know, the October Revolution. Um, it was actually the Hermitage where the, the masses um, um, climbed up the stairs. And, and so obviously there's a, an ingrained um, intellectual capacity, there's an ingrained kind of protectionism to anything that happens in the city. They've lived through a revolution and they still exist. The Hermitage um, is, is now one of the most important buildings in the world for art conservation. And, and the city developed over, over many years and it had many, many vertical elements within it. Uh, vertical dominance, as I like to call them in Russia. And these were removed by the Nazis during the bombing of, of the huge siege of Leningrad. So nowadays there are only a few vertical dominants left. And you see, you see the ones removed. Um, some of these vertical dominants, unfortunately, are industrial development. They have local power stations, and so the skyline of, of churches and cathedrals is shared with um, chimney stacks. And with the, the docks, the docks were very important because it was um, the survival of, of St. Petersburg was all about trade with the West. It was called Window on the West. So it was a very important part of the city. And then when the communist era came in, they constructed a uh, communication tower, uh, which you see on the left here, next to Peter and Paul Cathedral. And um, this is actually illuminated like a Christmas tree at night. And it's the same height as the Eiffel Tower, 312 meters. So this is kind of bizarre kind of response to what we're doing and uh, going on where they say, you know, this is a tall building for the city, it's going to spoil the city, and yet here they have a choice. They could leave this building uh, unilluminated, un they could just have the red dot at the top to avoid it from hitting aircraft, but no, they, they decide to celebrate it, they decide there's something important about this building and, and let's, let, let's really uh, make it obvious at night and, and let it sit beside the historical fabric. So here we are again, you can see the, the red line showing the, the kind of outline of the UNESCO boundary uh, coming, coming around the, the kind of really important parts at the centre of the city. And there are some fragments, some monasteries, there's one here and one here quite close to our site, which are then slightly removed from that, islands, you might say. And, and uh, as I said before, our, our site's about five and a half kilometres. And the, the, the TV tower, which is the same height as the Eiffel Tower, is 312 or whatever, is, is um, about four kilometres, three kilometres, depending on which landmark you take. But basically, there's this kind of strange response. On the one hand, there's a vertical dominant which they celebrate. On the other hand, they don't want a new one, which is from the century. You see the distances. And this is the kind of thing that people say, you know, we come, we write as painters, sculptors, architects, lovers of beauty in the name of history. And, and uh, I mean, against the direction of this very 
a monstrous tower in the heart of our capital, uh, already christened the Tower of Babel. Imagine for a moment a giddy, ridiculous tower dominating like a giant black smokestack. It makes you feel warm inside. <laughs> this truly tragic street lamp, I was enjoying this so much. I love research. And this belfry skeleton, this half-built factory pipe. Well, come on, you know, it's many things, but, you know, this was actually 1887, so they were obviously predicting my work even then. And it's, it's, it's from the newspaper Le Temps, and it's obviously about the Eiffel Tower. And I think it's, you know, it's just good to reflect on the kind of courage of your convictions, to, to, to think, you know, if they can say these horrible things about this object, which is a fantastic piece of engineering, and becomes a fantastic piece of architecture, then maybe they're not right about what they say about what we're doing either. And the little building on the left, the um, Montparnasse, maybe they are right about that. <laughs> so here we are back in St. Petersburg, um, and I, we started to do visual assessments, and so many of the visuals, the fantastic visuals we've seen earlier, um, are quite lucky in some ways because the context is one of high-rise, of, of other projects, you know, the, the groundwork is, is done. Um, here, the context is this beautiful horizontal grain, the beautiful Neva with its ice and, and flowing water, and Peter and Paul Cathedral there, and you see our tower, our tower which is going to dominate the landscape and just ruin the whole city. Um, you do see our tower, yeah? Well. There's a little circle just to remind me where it is because I always forget. Um, you know, really what we were trying to do right from the very start within the competition, you know, we, we met with the client, we spent every moment with the client trying to understand what, what, how much they loved their city. The client is actually working in Moscow and wants to live in St. Petersburg, work in St. Petersburg, it's their home, hometown, and they want to give something back to the city. So we spent hours with them just trying to understand that. And every, every minute, even during the competition phase, we tried to just get to the bottom of what they were looking for and also what we thought we could unlock for them. And so we tried to unlock a, a spire for, for this new millennium. And here are some other views, just to show you I'm, I'm being, you know, all, views all around the city and, and being open about the impact. Here, here's the impact um, further around the, the river bend. And again, on the right here, um, and these images weren't actually done by us, just in case you're wondering. You see the Russian typeface. This is actually done by the Historic Buildings Bureau of St. Petersburg, because they love it and they want to support it. So they flew a helicopter to the right height of our tower just to make sure nobody could cheat with any of the visuals and basically filled in our, our, our design on top. This is probably the one view where you do think, well, it is a spire and it is um, obvious. Um, but you actually have to really struggle to get that far back in this city to see this. And I still think it looks rather nice as well. Other views, you can't see it. You can't see it from Palace Square. Um, you know, it's, it's just not an issue. Another view where maybe you should be able to see it because it would actually help within the urban fabric to uh, determine vistas. And this is a postcard. This is the, the monastery that's the island element of the listing which is closer to our site. And uh, it's a postcard which will remain like this. It will still, there'll still be a postcard that looks like this and there'll still be a view that looks like this. Um, our tower will not affect that. And that's partly because the approach to that building is it's not an axis, it's, it's slightly off axis, so you have to look to the left to actually see it in its, in its glory. And our tower is actually located to the side here. But come on, you know, who am I fooling? You can always look to the side and you'll get a picture of small knee against the tower. Of course, won't you? And that, that, that's dreadful, isn't it? Well, what would Rostrelli think? This is what Rostrelli planned for his uh, convent mon mon monastery. Um, it was a 150 meter high uh, Baroque tower. And, you know, I, I think you should work with, with the place and you understand the place and work with it within your own time period, uh, but try and build on what's been done before. So as long as we make this thing such a beautiful object that people start to begin to love it and take it to their hearts, I, I think we'll be fine. And that's in the museum. But unfortunately, other development isn't really of the highest quality. And so we get a position where you get buildings juxtaposed 
with the, with the, the monastery, which aren't that sympathetic. And in fact, this, this building here in the background is actually on axis with, with the, the dome, and it will go up to about here, which is dreadful. But anyway, enough about the context, but the context is so important. We can't st start designing until we understand that context and understand what, what we're doing with it. And so, you know, going back to the competition, um, we, we rejected the super block, we rejected the, the selection of towers coming together, you know, another, another Chicago or another, another Shanghai. We went for a singular object with a base, a landscape base. And we looked at the historical development, which I've just talked about, from Peter and Paul, religion, through the tower that was never built, then Admiralty, St. Isaac's Cathedral, the Tatlin Tower, which you might have noticed there, um, with its, its, its um, helical form. And actually, there's a picture down below of the Tatlin Tower next to Peter and Paul. That was how sympathetic the communists were going to be. Um, and then the communications tower, and then our, our project. So we, we basically looked at religion, and then trade, each vertical dominant for each century, defining its own mark. And then communism, defining communication. And then for us, energy, the most important issue of our time. And actually, Arthur's presentation was, was fantastic. So, so many of the ideas we share, you know, and how we're developing it. So there's, there's obviously um, a vein of thought right now which is um, you know, very rich. Um, but this is our site. Um, it's a fortress, a beautiful fortress. Historical site um, where th this was owned by the Swedes and then the Russians and then the Swedes and then the Russians and it was eventually demolished. But this was the kind of spirit that we tried to, to capture within our building. We thought, this is used for defense. If we can turn that on its head, we can use it to get more daylight into the center of our plan. Because it, you know, part of that, that geometry, it means that every part of that surface is seen from another part. So we actually developed it through the Baroque and with, with kind of garden elements rising through the tower to create a new kind of tower. It's five towers in one. E the interesting thing about the brief was that each of the squares here are between 15 and 18 meters and they were to give a low rise solution. The client didn't realize that when they gave it to us. It was a low rise solution for high rise. And we actually thought, well actually, instead of just rejecting that and telling them how we should do it, Let's, let's incorporate it into our design. So we ended up with this kind of Baroque form where all of the floor plates, all of the usable space is orthogonal and then all of the breakout spaces is organic. But the overall building is organic. You see an axle as well. So we extrude the five blocks around a central circular core which has been removed for artistic reasons. You twist it and then you taper it to come together to one point. So it takes the kind of form of a tower and then it starts to say, with our technology, with our thinking now, maybe we can start to make even more complex forms. And how do they touch each other? And what's the spaces between these objects like? So we looked at the American model on the left, the core, the space around it, very commercial, very usable. The European model for low rise with the cruciform, with natural light, natural ventilation. You put them together, but then you put them together in a way that responds to sight with the five-sided star. And we use a fur coat to wrap around that to keep it warm. Our low energy concept for this uh, Gazprom is the energy provider for most of Europe, by the way, um, and beyond. Um, our, our energy concept is a fur coat. So Arthur's got his blanket. This is much more sexy, Arthur. <laughs> she had to stand several times for this before we got that photograph right. And we have our spaces, which are, work very similarly, but. Instead of doing the kind of buffer zone in a, in a vertical way, we actually do it in a horizontal way. So we actually take air through the corners of the building, um, which we're still modeling, but we're taking it through the corners to, to, to allow the corners to actually become ducts in themselves, vertical ducts. Um, and, and then we can use these for plant rooms and everything. So we have no openings within the skin other than through the corners. And you see there how the floor plate switches as it goes up and the spaces between the orthogonal blocks change to become organic. And then we layer that skin, that skin becomes a kind of, kind of crystalline form, which is inspired by the local bridge, the Art Deco bridge that's beside it. It's inspired by some paintings by Filinov, 
and we, he, he was a, an anti-cubist painter who tried to capture the whole spirit of the city in one painting. And I tried to do that in the skin as well. And you put these things together and you get this kind of very simple one and a half meter gridded um, glazing system on the inside and then this rich kind of almost gothic skin on the outside. But there's always, the idea is that as you move towards the building, there's always something more to see. And, and that's maybe one of the, the latest uh, renderings with the, the corners being clearly defined all the way up. And just to show you that it's not a figment of my imagination, um, we are testing it. Um, the, the skin, this is stainless steel, beautiful stainless steel. We're just testing it. And this is just to give you a sense of the scale of the object of, of desire, as it were. And the Germans are doing a fantastic job trying to break it to pieces and blow it down. And this is uh, some of the spaces that we capture between the two skins. It varies all the way up the building. And some of the office spaces and, and, and the kind of space you look into. Whoa. A little bit jerky. And some of the public spaces, of course. But the most, the most important public space in this building is a, a little bit like the Eiffel Tower. You know, it's that space at the top. And it will be, this will become a tourist attraction in itself, I hope. And, and it will bring lots of people to the city. And, and they will stand in this 70 meter high space um, with this lantern above them and look out over the city with its rotating restaurant and its um, public facilities below. There's the rotating restaurant. And this is the, the view. If anybody gets car sick, don't look up. So it's obviously led with richness. Um, that, that's what we're trying to, to kind of create, going back to the Baroque. And it's worth just seeing the shadows as well. So the idea is really just to not create the tallest building in the world, but to create one of the most beautiful buildings and to try and make the spaces within it as beautiful as possible as well. The, the lantern. And seen at night. And we can illuminate not just the lantern, but the skin too, to get this kind of effect of, of the water. The, the water flowing across the skin and also being quite crystalline. So in, in, during the day we'll get reflections from different surfaces as it bends around the curves. And at night we get more of the kind of flowing element. And this is the space that wraps around it, which would be another presentation all in itself, because we have a skyscraper, you might say, and we also have a ground scraper. Um, the two objects coming together within this space here, which has a kind of homage to the revolution because the revolution was filmed, the fantastic staircase in the Hermitage. So this is our version of that with this grand staircase, which takes you up to a picture of Smolny uh, Monastery at the end. Unfortunately, the computer's not rendering it very beautifully. So much of what we do is about light and shadow. Um, and that's us near the end. So hopefully, this is where we started, you know, this horizontal grain with this object. Well, actually, I think this is what we have, really. We have a, a city grain where we have religion, and then trade, and then communication, and now energy as four key vertical elements within the landscape of the city, um, all able to work with each other and to move on. And, uh, as, as was mentioned earlier, you know, we, we got through our height permission very recently. Um, and hopefully this means now we can proceed with the next round of very difficult and arduous technical approvals. But thank you for listening. Thank you. <laughs>